Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Yoga Healer podcast. And last time I talked to Lisa Van Susteren, we talked about her book, Emotional Inflammation, and I still have so many questions about that. But one of the things that we realized in the conversation is that we both have an interest in in, in reversing greenhouse gas emissions, I, you know, just in case future generations want to live on a thriving planet. And I just, just saying, right? Just saying. <laughs> Just saying, I mean, and I live, I mean, I think everyone can, you know, it's like we, we, I think are all experiencing changes in our ecosystems at this point. And, and there's a bit of the writing on the wall of like, what's going on and what do we have control over? And at the same time, we have like, it seems like out of, con like sort of out of control building and places that are becoming deserts, you know, like in Arizona and in Utah and Idaho and places where I frequent. And and so anyways, you were saying that there is this new initiative on the table and that this new initiative is actually it's it seems so so freaking cool that that there's this toxic substance control act and that a group of scientists filed an official petition with the EPA seeking the EPA to require carbon to basically be considered a toxic substance and that you're one of the leaders in this movement. So I said, yes, I'd love to have you talk about what this is and why you're behind it and what's going on. So I'm going to give you the floor. Okay. You're absolutely right. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving us the chance to talk about this. The petition, which was delivered to the EPA by Jim Hansen, the climate scientist who first brought the issue of global warming to Congress in 1988-1989, an atmospheric chemist, John Burks, Richard Heady, who's an expert on carbon concentrations in the atmosphere, and I, as well as Don Viviani, who is a long time, 35 years at the EPA, he was the one who first had the idea to look at carbon dioxide as falling under the regulatory power of the Toxic Substances Control Act. So it was the five of us plus Dan Gelpern, who was an environmental lawyer, happens to be Jim Hansen's lawyer, who were at the EPA to deliver this petition. So the petition can be seen on your website. People can go there and they can endorse that petition either as an individual or a group. And the more people who endorse it and organizations, of course, the better. All right. So the substance of it is as you described. So the Toxic Substances Control Act, this is a done deal. This is not going to Congress and pleading with people. This is not going to the, the Senate and making deals. This is established law. All it has to be is enforced. And so it is up to the executive branch, in other words, the White House executive branch, and the agencies that respond to the directives of the laws that we write to execute it. So the Toxic Substances Control Act, first written in 1976, and then reinforced in 2016, and reinforced in 2016 to give the EPA the power to take action irrespective of cost. So this was, this is existing law with a lot of teeth. And it basically says, that the EPA has the regulatory power to control a substance that is deemed an unreasonable risk of harm to our health and to that of the environment. So you can say what's with the unreasonable risk of harm. Well, let's say we decide cars are an unreasonable risk or are risk to our health, which they are in the environment. But the question is whether or not it's an unreasonable risk. What's our alternative? But when you look at CO2, carbon dioxide, as a substance that presents an unreasonable risk, it's unreasonable because some people will say, well, we've got to have it. We've got to have industry. It's just not true. We have alternatives. We have renewable energy. So it is, and if we're talking about 
Original. And we have like more engineers on the planet now than ever. It's like, you know, everyone's going to school to become an engineer, right? It's not like we couldn't put a ton of brain power behind transitioning a global industry. Thank you. And in addition, the issue is that our survival is on the line. Yeah. And this is no joke. We are experiencing now the extreme weather events and conditions that have been predicted for 30 years or more. And this is just the beginning. As I've said, coming from a family of baseball lovers, this is the farm team. This is, this is just the opening inning. This is the amateur hour when Mother Nature really gets rolling. And I've been told it'd be about 2030 if we don't rein things in. This is, this isn't, we ain't seen nothing yet. So the Toxic Substances Control Act gives the EPA the power to declare CO2 a toxic substance, which means that they can then trigger all the levers they need, both to reduce it and we can talk about the different ways. And in addition, and this is what is really key, the EPA has the power to require industry to participate in its cleanup. Now we can say, wow, wow, wow. That's what a Superfund site is. That is industry being required to clean up a mess they've made. And we have done this with lead paint. We have done it with asbestos. We have done it with dioxin, with PCBs. We have done it with chloral fluorocarbons, which are themselves a greenhouse gas. They were the cause of the ozone layer. And once we began to rein in those chloral fluorocarbons, the ozone layer is healing. It is closing. So we got what we need, Kate. We can do this. So I guess the, the question that I'm wondering in terms of the, you know, this, this uh, historical evidence, this, that, okay, we have all these preceding industries to follow that. How big were those industries? Like in terms of like the CFCs or the lead paint compared to this industries producing CO2, like what's the magnitude? Is it like, see, you know, let's just take CFCs. Was that like 2%? you know, like 2% of the global industry was impacted, whereas like CO2, it's like 70% or like what, what do those numbers start to look like or the sort of the scale of industry interests that are going to try to shut this down? Well, it's huge. The fossil fuel industry will throw everything it's got and it's got a lot. The fossil fuel industry, I mean, billions of dollars of profit and we know that they funnel a good deal of those profits into lobbying, which is essentially buying votes of people, districts that or that have a focus on fossil fuel production. So we've seen the horse trading and obviously we're, our democracy is really, and our survival really depends on our getting money out of politics. Let's face it. Yeah. Money has no business being in politics. What in the world? It's clear it's a quid pro quo. I will give you money. And the people who are most in support of fossil fuels are inescapably the people who get the most money. So we're talking about a huge gap. You're right. From chlorofluorocarbons to the fossil fuel industry, there is a huge gap. But the principle yeah. is the same. When well, and it's cool. I mean, to me, just even even seeing it that way of like, oh, right, it is a toxic substance and we have the Toxic Substances Control Act and we have all these precedents for, like you said, for 50, close to 50 years, we have precedents that like, hey, we actually care as humans to control industry. Like we actually get that we don't have policies in place to evaluate what an industry is producing while they're producing it. So then we retroactively have to ban things that are already in motion, that are already profit-driven, that already are paying off politicians, right? That we have to actually do like reverse engineer the damn thing. But to even, to me, like when you said Toxic Substances Control Act, I was like, that makes a lot of sense. And if 
enough people could really kind of wake up to like, oh, wait, we actually have control over what, because there's so much stuff right now that I see that should be under the Toxic Substances Control Act or just have more regulation that's just hurting human health and planetary health and really limiting the options of future generations to have any sort of decent lifestyle to thrive. Like, you know, like let's, let's call a toxin a toxin, let's categorize it correctly and let's get people thinking about it in a way that they can actually see these precedents and see that like, oh wait, we can change industries that are already well underway in, in profit earning. Well, your point is well taken. There are lots of things that are harmful to our health, but the scale yeah, the scale. Yeah. And we can talk about atrazine, androgen disruptors. We can talk about yeah. owned up. We can talk about yeah. all sorts of food additives. We can go on and on and on. But CO2 can take yeah. us down the whole shebang. So the important thing for people to realize is that the EPA, under the Toxic Substances Control Act, has lots of levers. For example, they can regulate industry with a fee and dividends so that they charge taxes on the fossil fuel industry. And those taxes are 100% refunded to the public based on the public's financial needs. So we can tox fossil fuel industry in a way that has them want to change to renewable industries and has them wanting to stop lobbying and has them encouraged with financial incentives to transition to renewable energy. So we can do a fee and dividend. That was been proposed many, many times. There's also something called a cap and trade. And the easiest way to understand that is you say, okay, this is how much carbon dioxide we can have this year, next year, the year after, in order to stay under 1.5 degrees centigrade of heating. And to understand cap and trade, it's like, let's say you got a big piece of pie, a big pie, and you want a double share of it because you want to dump more CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, you can buy that extra piece of pie from another industry that's saying, hey, we're going to go green. We're not going to eat pie. We're going to eat something nutritious that we can pick off a tree. And so we don't need to bother with a pie. So what it does is it offers incentives for industry to do the right thing. Yeah. And then in addition, the EPA could also encourage all the agencies, or if not encourage, put the pressure on them or require them to be energy efficient in buildings, mm -hmm. in all of our government buildings, to only use electric vehicles, to use sustainable products, to engage in energy efficiency across the board. There are all sorts of things. So this is like for a climate activist, it's like Christmas morning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's wild to me is when I was in 1995, I was at Carleton College and I wrote my we had like an undergraduate dissertation type of a system there. And I wrote my paper on like politics and economics of, of climate change policy. In what year was this? 1995. And it was like all cap and trade, like all this stuff, like it was all full cost accounting. Like we are, we've known this for, it, you know, and like you said, like the climate modeling that was predicted 30 years ago is happening now. Like I was at the EPA, you know, the in DC at the conferences watching these climate models and the IPCC. And, you know, it just, to me, it's like, okay, we've, <laughs> we've, we've advanced 30 years and we have really cool fucking phones now, like, and they're really fun and we have really neat smart cars. And like, thanks to Elon Musk for creating an electric car industry. And like, we, we can see that we can do things as humans, that we can be incredibly smart and innovative and change things really, I mean, it's like, honestly, like really pretty quickly. I mean, if you look at even COVID and like how quickly you can shut things down and open things up and create demand for toilet paper and hand sanitizer, like we are so freaking resilient and adaptable as a species. And if we could just decide that like, you know, our children deserve an atmosphere that can grow plants that can produce oxygen so they can breathe. Yeah. 
frankly, I, it's not the public so much anymore. Okay, yeah, tell me. Really, it's really a, the, the, a political world that is blocking things. And it's just a few people. And I'm not going to single, single out the names here. People know who they are. But until we have a political process that really sets up a structure for us to succeed, yeah, we're going to have trouble. And so I think most people, if you ask them that they want action on climate, of course they do. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to convince people with charts and things. You were a whole decade ahead of me. But we don't have to put up charts. All we have to do, uh, as Groucho Marx said, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? We can see the floods and the fires, and we're experiencing yeah, yeah. heat waves. Yeah. Or we're in the floods and the fires. We don't need any more fancy stuff. Yeah. What we need now is for people to get out there and vote. And to find the politician who makes, or the candidate who makes climate a priority and make sure that person gets into office. Because once we have a political body that is serving us rather than yeah. themselves to stay right. in power, yeah, we're going to get somewhere. And yeah. we can get, there's a famous economist, and I'm going to borrow this from Al Gore, who borrowed it from a famous economist. I'll butcher it a bit. But the economist said things happen, first of all, they take longer than you ever thought they would. Mm. And then they change faster than you ever could have imagined. Yeah, so I, I hang on to that. Yeah. I look at the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and it a halfway measure, but it is more than we've had. And it took me and a lot of other climate activists off the ledge, so to speak, off the ground. And it may be the catalyst to a more enlightened triggering event among other leaders that this is where this is where we're going to be, where we need to be. And business will also recognize that they're a dinosaur. And yeah. they better they better change now before it's too late. And I mean, not only too late for their industry, but too late for us as a civilization. Right. Yeah. And, I, you know, and the whole, I mean, even with the, is regulation, is environmental regulation bad for the economy? I've, I just feel like that argument was played out 30 years ago in terms of like, absolutely not, because it just promotes, a, it just promotes a pivot. And we're so good. We're so good, especially the kind of technology that we have now compared to 30 years ago. Like we were so good at quickly pivoting, right? And so it just actually opens up opportunities. And I don't, and I don't see key people talking about it like that as like, oh, wait, humans are natural. We're naturally engineers. We are naturally, we naturally love to architect our environment. We're good at that. We've been doing that for, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, at least you could say since agriculture. So we've got at least 12,000 years, right, of that under our belts. But now we have insane amounts of ways to do that and, and quickly and, and to be financially incentivized. That's what I like to cap and trade is like, just make it a game. Make it a trading game. And then if anyone wants to win at the game, then they play harder. They just play harder. And there's plenty of people that want to play hard and win. In addition to that argument, which is the, a mainstay, there is also the reality of what it's like when we're not changing. We're spending about $150 billion a year on cleanup. And if you take the national average inflation adjusted, that's about three times the amount in the 40 years prior to the last five years, three times the annual amount that we used to need in the past to clean up after extreme weather. Oh, wow. Well, that's just the cleanup, three times the national average inflation adjusted. Then how about what it's like? Looking at the cost to us psychologically, when I look at kids and when I talk to kids and I realize not all of them, but some of them are in such deep despair, Kate, yeah, that, yeah. that it scares me for the future because you cannot have a society that's healthy 
when its individual members are angry and fearful in despair, wondering why they should have children and things like that. Is that yeah. everybody? No. But let's be realistic that the emotional toll on individuals and community as, as a result is, is a horrendous and, and pervasive growing problem. Yeah, I mean, I had it as a teenager, for sure. I was involved with Mass Hope. High, it was a Massachusetts high school that's organized to protect the earth. We were really involved with Senator John Kerry. And, you know, I mean, this was back in the, this was back in the 80s, like, you know, like oh, late 80s. No, early. Are you serious? Yeah, totally. I mean, ab absolutely. And you get the, you get the people that care the most, that are like the most sensitive and yep. they become the most depressed, despondent, un not wanting to reproduce, like you mentioned, like not good. Like this, this is, this is not natural selection in a way. That's right. That's right. And Kate, tell me, I, I got to ask you this. I became involved. I ran for the U.S. Senate, as I said in our last conversation in 2005. And that's when I really started to run the numbers and realize then I got trained by Gore of the degree to which we were under threat, planet in peril from global warming. But you were talking about these things in the 80s? I was, I started an organization when I was in high school. And I, I'm trying to think, when did I graduate? I started, 91, I graduated. So I was in high school in the late 80s, early 90s. And I started a, a group called, with my best friend called Students Concerned About Tomorrow. She wanted to start at a group, a club. And I was like, and she was really into the more of the social equity. And I was really into planetary consciousness and, and just raising awareness. I was also really fortunate to live, I mean, 15 minutes from the nearest, like, or from like what be, later became Whole Foods. So Bread and Circus was in Wellesley, Massachusetts. So I had an experience of going into a grocery store where I wanted everything. And I, and like everything was like the smells, like it smelled like food in there. Like you could smell the apples. Mm. And that was, and I had a very conventional childhood. I had also had health issues. I had my, my, I had migraines from probably, I probably had migraines as a baby. They were my first memories as a you know, as a small child. So I had constipation and migraines and then I had allergies. And then, you know, I just had all the stuff that's caused by the standard American diet, essentially. And I just had it early on. So I was already looking for like, wait, something's really broken here. And then I was fortunate enough to work. I worked for Student Conservation Association for a summer and I met people that were thinking on the global environmental level. And so I got plugged into planetary consciousness as a teenager. And then once, you know, it's like once you're plugged into something that you're like, this makes sense. Like you just see it. And I was into naturally a meta thinker, naturally into naturally into macroeconomics and, and global politics just by my nature of like what I was interested in. And I could just see the, you know, just sort of could see the writing on the wall from a pretty early age. And my dad was really great because he was a devil's advocate entirely. And, and he loved debate. And he was on, you know, he was on like, humans can't ever impact the earth. We don't have that much power. The earth is so big. And he was an international businessman, like literally flying around the world and looking down at how vast the planet was. And so he just didn't get it. So I would, you know, at the dinner table every night, just kind of come to him with like my best arguments and he would just shoot him down. And I never really changed his mind until maybe I think 2015 or something when he started to come around to like, oh yeah, climate change is an issue. <laughs> Do you remember the 80s, Dad? Do you remember dinner? But I had an idea of how men in industry, men in business, men with a profit motive, men running international business type companies, like how they were thinking from an early age. So I wasn't raised in a hippy dippy household that was eating organic food. Like I, I had to more or less make all my own food in high school because I wanted to eat differently and my mom wasn't going to cook for more than the family, you know? So I was just that kind of a kid that was like type A, super driven, really into people who were thinking on at a higher order of consciousness, able to plug into those people. And then we got people like Senator Kerry to come speak at her high school. And you know what I learned early on 
was that you can actually change things. Like even I changed our, I got involved with, with that group, Students Concerned About Tomorrow. I was talking with the superintendent of our school district and I was like, you know, we should recycle just because people should be like, who cares where it ends up? Like, I know we're not producing that much waste as a school and it doesn't make any economic sense and all that. But like, let's just imagine that students are more aware of waste, of like the entire waste cycle. And this guy was actually open minded, like not the principals or the whatever they call the, the, the head administrators, the headmasters of the schools. They weren't interested. But I learned you could go above Right. And that's kind of what I see that you guys are doing here with the Toxic Substances Control Act is like you can go above individual politicians. You can go above this, you know, the Senate and the House and go right to the executive branch and be like, well, if there's an executive branch that should be concerned about this is at least pretending to be concerned about this. I mean, it's all already in place all we have to do is flex the muscle and follow our own rules right like follow, follow our, our own, own rules. rules correct this is existing legislation it empowers the epa to regulate carbon dioxide as a toxic substance and to require its cleanup and it can do it at a pace that is consistent with what knowledgeable people believe is necessary for us to survive. So what's not to like? What we will know in a couple of weeks, what the EPA decides, and it's a no brainer. I don't know how you could find otherwise than that CO2 is a toxic substance and that it's an unreasonable risk of harm to our health and that of the environment. I mean, we submitted 80 pages and we could have submitted 80,000 pages right. showing the ways in which carbon dioxide is harming us. And I will just reassert again that one of the issues that people are not focusing on is the psychological damage. And you can imagine as a psychiatrist, and I am the expert witness on the psychological damages to kids in the Juliana case, which is against the federal government for inaction, and in the Held versus Montana case, which is against the state of Montana for inaction on climate. I have talked to those kids. I know what's going through their minds. You, it, we, need to, we need to recognize what they're going through, and we need to recognize that this will be amplified across the entire, our entire society. Not to mention the people who are directly hurt, who are on the line of fire, either with extreme weather events or who are living in places that become unlivable and they become refugees. The whole issue right. of border problems in the South is that many parts of Central America have become unlivable. And there is violence and gangs because the economic livelihood has been compromised because we do not, they do not have the agricultural output that they had. People don't have money. They're storming the border, so to speak, in order to try to save themselves. Well, these are the repercussions that we don't always see in climate. And, you know, I laugh sometimes Canada in a more northern latitude, which will be cooler. I, I keep saying, boy, it's, it's Canada that's going to need to put the, the fence up. Because we're yeah. all, you know, all of us are thinking, hmm, what's, well, how can I go north to avoid some of the problems here? So we need to take action and we need to take action now. So one other question I have is like, say this, say by some miraculous act, this happens, this goes through the Toxic Substances Control Act. Can the next administration just reverse it? That is something that I, it, it would be hard for them to reverse it, it what? is because it's law. It is not what is called executive orders. If you have an executive order, like president demands that something happen, yeah. uh, that power lies within him. So the next president can turn around and that power residing within him can turn around and say, I will reverse that order. But this is legislative. This is Congress, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. This is law. The only way you can reverse a law is to have it come before the legislative branch again 
and be reversed that way. So I'm hard pressed to understand how it, this could be reversed since it's not an executive order. Okay, so what so what can people do? So they can please gonna, go to your yeah. website and uh, click on the link to endorse the petition uh, that calls upon the EPA to declare carbon dioxide a toxic substance. Okay, awesome. And, and we'll do it that preferably as an organization, but doing it as an individual is good too. Okay, awesome. Awesome. And we'll put that link right in. Yes. And the there chat. also is on your website frequently asked questions and answers. And there's also a column that's very readable by a well known columnist here at the Washington Post, Eugene Robinson who nicely describes uh, the whole process, including the guts of the Toxic Substances Control Act and why it's so important for the EPA to take action on it. Okay, awesome. And for people who want to know what the website is, it's, it's, it's the Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative. So it's cprclimate.org forward slash about forward slash actions dash campaigns forward slash petition dash two dash EPA. We'll put that in there and let's see how many of these we can sign and spread and, and share it on your social. I mean, what's not to say, yeah, I had to share it on, if we want to change society, really, it's by connecting with the people that we're connected to. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the key elements that people don't always realize. Yes, you know, having influencers say things um, but that can be a factor. But the best research shows that when we reach out to our friends, our contacts, our tribe, that that's the most effective way to induce a cultural change. And just as there are climate tipping points, there are social tipping points. And that is where we come in handy. Oh, I love it. I love it. Absolutely. And I just want to, like, I'm just going to bring Elon Musk up again with, like, one of the coolest things in seeing what he did with electric cars and then crowd, and then he basically open sourced the code that they wrote at Tesla. Like, humans want to help other humans. Like, humans and technology that invent something that's better for the planet, they get that. They get that, like, wait, we're all in this together and we can share the advances and then industries actually grow together. So it's, it's to me, it's so important to look to people, to look to success stories, to look at, like you said, the, all of the legislation in the past that's actually, that we have set in place as not just a national culture, but also as a global culture in order to say like, hey, what, we actually have the power to design the future the way we want, the way we know we should ethically. Well, thank you for your work, Lisa. I mean, both on the emotional inflammation and on this work with, with Climate Protection and the Restoration Initiative. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Obviously, I can sit here and shake my fist at the gods or holler at the <laughs> television, but that doesn't get, get me very far. It's people like you who get this message out. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And thank you for being there since the 80s. 